up. So today I shall have to jar, which is to say, no circumambulation, no particular celebration. <clears throat> Tomorrow, when Kalpansa, we remind you all to um, stipulate inside upon a boundary for yourself and before chanting the formula we must say na wa se imang ke ma sang wa sang de ni three times it's really um the distinctions between Pansar and Ork Pansar are not really um, so vital, so obvious, um, the way that we live here at our daily schedule and doesn't really change or need to change. Nevertheless, when you have a certain period of time that is given a name and a kind of identity and that can sometimes be a um, stimulus to taking on some special practices or um, at the very least reviewing one's practice in the past months and if there are some the slackness or some imbalance in the practice and uh, making a fresh start and trying to deal with that. The Yasala Pucha day, as you know, today we commemorate the teaching of the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta and the day in which the Dhamma wheel was set rolling and that metaphor of the wheel is a very simple one but also profound that the spokes of the wheel join at the center in the, the hub, the hub is still and the spokes revolve around it, the wheel moves round and round, but on the ground it moves in a line. So there are a number of interesting reflections on the relationships between, relationship between the different um, elements of the Eightfold Path the way that they manifest in the world. The Buddha, as we know, had some reservations about teaching, not through any lack of compassion, simply out of feeling unsure as to whether or not anyone would be able to understand these teachings or this truth. But eventually he was persuaded, you understand, by Brahma Sampati and seeing that his former teachers had already passed away, the people he felt were most advanced or most spiritually mature, those ready to hear the Dhamma, were his five former luxits or students who had left him feeling abandoned and betrayed and gone off to Sarnath 
So the Buddha walked from Bhagaya to Sana. And as we understand it, the story tells us that begin with the the Panchawaki were were not even going to show the traditional forms of respect, We're going to wash his feet and show the respect of a student to a teacher. But once the Buddha had sat down, his whole demeanor was different. There was something about him. And as soon as he began to speak, their doubts vanished. I always find the, the psychological acumen, the intelligence, the, like the, they say the almost, almost like a worldly intelligence of the Buddha, which um, accompanied his super mundane wisdom seen about how he began his discourse with taking into account the mental states of his listeners. But these were people who still harbored negative feelings and were not convinced um, that the Buddha was on the, the path to liberation anymore and were presumably expecting him to return to his comfortable life in the palace. So the very first words, the Buddharatas, are a proclamation that the path of sensuality and sensual indulgence um, is an extreme to be avoided. So we can imagine the Panchabhagis heaving a sigh of relief, or maybe we got it wrong. Maybe um, he's not going back to the palace after all. Maybe he's seen the light and he's coming back to be our leader in ascetic practices again. But then the next sentence is a refutation of the ascetic practices that they've been pursuing for the past years. And so now the, the, the listeners are in a state of some confusion and in a very kind of fertile state of interest. And it's this point that the Buddha introduces the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, the Middle Way, and all of the fundamental teachings which he continued to express in various ways, variations, until at the very end of his life, before the Parinibbana, we find that most of the teachings revolved around these Four Noble Truths. So this, this discourse, we assume it must be a, a summary of the discourse. I don't think it's, um, that it's like a word-for-word -word, um, account. There was no recording device. Uh, there was no Venerable Ananda ready to memorize. Um, they didn't even know they were going to listen to a talk until the Buddha sat down. So presumably it's a summary of the main points. And again, the, the, the brevity of this talk, it's, it's not very long at all. And uh, I would assume the Buddha actually spoke for much longer. And there are some things that make, or at least have made me wonder over the years, for instance, the reference to the five khandhas without any explanation of what they are. Um, does that mean that the um, dividing the body and mind into five khandhas was an accepted uh, convention even before the Buddha became enlightened? Um, or 
um, were the explanations left out in the eventual transcript or the eventual text of the Dhammachakapavatana Sutta. There are, there are things that we, we cannot ever know, but I think what the thing that impresses me is that the Buddha's enlightenment was so profound and going transcending all concepts, all language. And yet within uh, this time, this short time, the Buddha had been able to reflect upon it and articulate it and to come up with this really clear and methodical and precise and and um, intriguing teachings. This was the day that I was saying to the lay people this morning, it's like you, know, you could make this like communication day, world communication day. It's the day that the most profound and beneficial words that were ever spoken um, were spoken for the first time and they had um, this incredible effect that the Panchawagi became devoted disciples as a result and of course Venerable Kandanya became the first stream entry. So the Samma Samputa is distinguished from like a Pacheka Buddha in the, in the teaching. And so, although the Buddha's enlightenment was um, complete and comprehensive from the, the night he sat under the Bodhi tree on Visaka Puja, I think it's fair to say that he became, his Buddhahood really became complete the moment he started to teach. Similarly, the Dhamma, which previous uh, to the, Dhamma, the exposition of Dhamma Jaka Sutta, had been insights, understanding within the Buddha's mind and heart. By the teaching of the Dhamma Chaka Sutta, it became part of our world. It became part of our history. It became the beginning of the sasana. There was, there was a Buddha before this desana, but there was not really a sasana. There was no transmission, there was no teaching, there was no path. So the exposition of the truths of dukkha and the course of dukkha, the proclamation of a cessation of dukkha and the delineation of a path to that cessation. These all occurred and appeared in the world on a Salaha Puja day. So we can say it's the day that the Dhamma came to fruition. So not just the the Dhamma as the, the truth, the way things are, but the verbal exposition, articulation of that truth. And as a result of this talk, the Panchawagi became bhikkhus and Anya Kondanya became a Sotapanna. So this was also the day in which the Sangha appeared in the world. Both the Samuti Sangha, the conventional Sangha, and the Arya Sangha. So once again, the, this is the day when the Sangha uh, became complete. So we, I think it's fair to say that Buddhism really began on the Salaha Pucha. The three refuges of Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha um, became manifest in the world. So it's uh, incredibly 
important and auspicious date for all of us. And I think uh, it's time well spent to um, go back to the Dhammachaka Sutta, Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, read it, chant it, reflect upon it, and celebrate this special day in a way appropriate to the Samana life. I'd like to share these few words with you. Dhammayam Dhamma Ovata Sata Satu Tata Mase Satu 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 Anumodam